uh, to this program. I'm so excited that you can be joining us this evening. My name is uh, Carol Wanjao. I'm an executive pastor at Mabuno Church. I'm also a marriage and family therapist. And I'm so excited that today you're joining us uh, in this, what I, what I promise is an amazing conversation. I have with me a friend who I met a couple of years ago. Her name is uh, Nancy Hutton. We met in Texas, you know, a few years ago. And and uh, Nancy is a sex therapist, believe it or not, not common in our neck of woods. She's a sex therapist. Uh, she's a leadership coach and licensed professional counselor. She's also an, an adjunct uh, professor and fellow at the Townsend uh, Institute at Concordia University. She's been married for 46 years. You know, she has four married sons and eight grandchildren. You can tell she's an expert in all ways, <laughs> professionally and also just her life experience. And so I'm so excited, Nancy, that you can join us. It's such an honor that you can be here with us uh, in this program. So Nancy, just to, uh, you know, just to start us off, maybe you can give us an idea, you know, what, what is happening? I mean, uh, in your neck of your woods, you know, in the States, uh, we're, we're just uh, watching on TV and, you know, just hearing, you know, very scary stories coming uh, from the States. How is COVID affecting families? I mean, you know, you're, you're on the ground, you're dealing with lives, you know, what is happening at the family level? Mm -hmm. Well, I think people have been very fearful and, you know, life always boils down to, are we going to walk in fear or faith? But it's been pretty rocky for people. Um, there's a lot of economic unrest. There's political unrest. You've probably seen the violence in our yes. cities and in our streets and how combative and polarized we are as a country right now. Yeah. And so I think it just rises the fear level. And then with COVID, there's a lot of unknowns. Yeah. You know, how long do we need to stay in our homes and when can we start living life in normal ways and traveling yeah. and going places and seeing family and friends and our mm -hmm. churches are most of our churches are still shut down yeah. so it's been a very it's been a very challenging time in our country oh wow oh yeah. wow and and you know as we were talking earlier we too have been affected i mean it's amazing that this is a global issue <laughs> Uh, no one has been spared, you know, from, from this COVID. But maybe you could share with us, what are some of the, you know, factors that are helping families? You know, I'm sure there are families that are coping very well. And there are other families that are really struggling. Maybe you could tell us just a couple of, you know, a couple of things that you've noticed with families that are coping well. You know, what are some of those factors, that, you know, that, that are helping families, you know, cope? I, I think the families... And I, and I think people, you know, people are people, right? Yes. So in all families, even families that are doing well, I'll see moments when they're panicking and they're not doing well. And then they have to kind of get grounded again, get focused again, that God is good even in really bad times. Yeah. And so I think it's people of faith that are holding, being held by their faith. Yeah. and are grounded by faith that God is good. And at the end of the day, we were meant to be resilient people, even when bad things were happening. Yeah. So, um, you know, to hold on to that, that bad things are going to happen. It is a part of life. Yeah. We will suffer. Suffering is a part of life. But to remember that God is still good in the midst of that. Yeah. So what I've encouraged place to do is have a long range plan this this is not going to be over tomorrow yeah oh wow life is not going to go back to normal tomorrow and so to have a long range goal that it's this is going to take some time we need to be adaptable and we need to be flexible and remember that god has made us resilient yeah. and we be strong in the Lord, even when things are bad. Yeah. And that we too can get through dark times and times of suffering. And um, I know for me, Carol, just on a personal level, 
um, I'm very extroverted. Yeah. And, and I, I was used to going a lot, traveling. Yeah. And then I had to come home and be still. Yeah. I kept working, but more through Zoom. And my goodness, I just miss seeing people's faces yeah. and being in contact with people. Yeah. Um, I had some days where I just really had to grieve. There's been a lot of losses. Oh, wow. And God reminds us that we have to grieve when life is hard. Yeah. And we can't pretend it's all okay because it's not okay. We're living very uncertain times. All of us are. Yeah, Around that's the world. true. Yeah. We aren't certain how this is going to end up. Yeah. But if we will stop and really let ourselves sit with our pain, sit with the disappointment, sit with mm -hmm. the losses like some people have lost their jobs yeah that's so true they've lost their health they're uncertain about their economics they're uncertain about what the future looks like and it's so helpful you know scripture says to us mourn with those who mourn yeah you know and the holy spirit comforts those who mourn yeah so sometimes i think we can go through life without comfort because we aren't taking the time Mm -hmm. to acknowledge that god this is sad this is scary this is hard i'm fearful but when we do there comes a relief when we let ourselves have just a good boohoo you know like, good cry <laughs> like, yes this is sad and hard so i know in the beginning of this sometimes i would just be getting ready and feeling the heaviness of all of it and i'm like okay i need to take like three minutes out and just let myself cry yeah and feel my sadness feel my disappointment yeah my pain. yeah and then i would feel this lifting and then i could go about my day oh wow yeah but just taking the time to acknowledge you know this is what i'm feeling i'm feeling I'm feeling disappointed or I'm feeling uncertain or I'm feeling fear. Uh, but I, I believe bringing it to God. Um, and, I, and I think that's what you're saying, just bringing that to God. And, and he comforts us. I mean, that's such, such the am amazing thing as a, as a father. He, he kind of, he comforts us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's okay that things aren't okay. Yeah. Okay. And God wants to meet us in those dark, dark nights of our soul in those hard places where our pain our disappointment is um you know what's happened to a lot of families as we've spent more time together some of the issues that have needed to really be addressed have emerged Tough time, yeah yeah it's like some of the marital problems that need to be addressed some of the problems in our parenting that need to be addressed yes are like right in front of our faces <laughs> we cannot our, run yeah, we're not just going, 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 going. We're yeah. having to go, oh, this is icky. Or, oh, <laughs> yeah. this, this is not working. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Which is actually really good for all of us. Yeah. To take a hard look at our marriages, ourselves, our families. Yeah. Kind of see, oh, I'm not responding very well right now. Yeah. Where oh. do I need to have some growth? Yeah. Um, Nancy, there's this book of yours. Uh, this is um, Love and Sex. I don't know if people can see that, um, uh, which you have written. And, um, you know, your, and, and, you know it's, it's really along your, you know, your profession <laughs> as a sex therapist. And in here, you know, you talk about, um, uh, you know, just some of the struggles. I mean, you know, here we are talking about how people cope. And, um, you know, you've just been talking and saying, yes, you know, we go through difficult times and, you know, there's, there's a healthy coping, you know, there's a healthy way of just coming, you know, before God and just saying, this is what I'm experiencing and so on. But in this book, you talk about um, addictions and you talk about, you know, specifically sex addictions and pornography and um, as uh, uh, unhealthy ways of, of ways that people cope, you know, which are unhealthy. Maybe you could speak a little bit into that and just, yeah, just elaborate a little bit into that as you have, you know, worked with uh, various people. Yeah, thank you, Carol. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, 
in America, we're in the midst of another sexual revolution, aren't yeah. we? Where yeah. sexuality is being politicized and it's very messy and anything goes. And so we're in a very challenging time sexually. So I'm so glad that you brought this topic up because what we know is during COVID and while people are being more isolated, that um, the statistics on pornography are just skyrising. Oh, wow. And, um, and I certainly understand that. People are hurting, people are bored, people are lonely. Yeah. So we can look for things that are going to bring temporary comfort. Yeah. What we don't understand is the long-term effects of pornography. Yeah. So pornography literally rewires our brain. It damages our prefrontal cortex. It's yeah. meant to be the smart part of our brain. Yeah. <laughs> it damages that part of our brain and makes us all less relational. Okay. And so the more, um, and porn is so addictive that, yeah. You know, people can think, well, this is harmless and, you know, it, it won't hurt me. It won't hurt my marriage. It won't hurt my relationships, but it's very deceptive. I've worked with so many people yeah. that have gotten hooked into porn and then they have a hard time stopping because it's more addictive than crack cocaine. Oh, really? Yes. And nowadays yeah. it's so readily available. My goodness, our children are exposed to it yeah. so easily. And unfortunately, this is such a big industry that targets children, targets vulnerable people, yeah. and wants to just suck them in. Oh, wow. and so, um, but I also believe that porn usage is really about some deeper issues. Okay. Yeah, well, maybe you could mm -hmm. maybe you could delve a little bit into that. Yeah, just yeah, just what, what you know, what 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 are you seeing? What are some of the, the issues that bring about that? Yeah, so I have a lot of compassion for people who are struggling, and I think the church needs to have a lot of compassion for people who are struggling with sexual issues. I really believe sex is more of a fruit than it is the root. And so, you know, we always need to go to the root. Mm -hmm. And for like 90% of sex addicts or people sex struggling with sexual issues, they have experienced some sort of trauma in their lifetime. Okay. And you know, most of us have. We either have abuse or with sexual traumas growing up, there was neglect. There's verbal abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse growing up, or they've experienced something in adulthood. Now, some people have smaller traumas where just bad things have happened to them in life, you know, and it didn't feel like it was huge, but yet it's affected them emotionally and psychologically. Yeah. So I always like to dig down and say, hey, Talk to me about some of the things that you've had happen in your life that maybe you've never talked to anybody about. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think it's so important that we open the door for people and make it safe and say, tell me your stories. I've had 70 year olds say to me, mm -hmm. especially men, well, I was sexually abused when I was five years old and I've never told anybody. Wow. You know, and they've carried deep, dark secrets that have been cloaked in shame. Yeah. And my goal is, let's de-shame. It, yeah. it wasn't your fault that bad things happened to you. Yeah. But you've been carrying it around like it was your fault. Yeah. And then we all look for ways to cope, whether that's overworking, eating too much chocolate, drinking or porn or acting out sexually. Yeah. It, stems from some deep wounds in our hearts. Yeah. And I love what Jesus said. He said, I came to heal yeah. the brokenhearted. And we have to remember that at the core of the gospel is the good news that Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. Wow. And we've all had our hearts broken. Yeah. He come to heal the brokenheaded. He came to heal the brokenhearted. It's it's at our core, it's our emotional, psychological, spiritual places yeah. where we've all been broken. 
And Jesus wants to heal those places, whether they're sexual or whatever it is. He's not ashamed. He's not ashamed of our brokenness. He, no, he's he's, I, I thank God he's not. <laughs> I really thank God he's not. But maybe even as you're talking about pornography and the effects of pornography, uh, perhaps I, would, you, would you just talk to us about sexualization of the culture? Because um, you're, you, know, you said that we're going through another sexual revolution. Uh, there's a lot of sexualization. So maybe you could you know, just kind of, uh, break down that what what that not the sexual revolution but you know just the uh, uh, just the sexualization of culture you know because uh, we're talking about people being abused uh, so for the person who is doing the abusing you know uh, there's also a lot of sexualization you know a, a man sees a, a little girl and you know he doesn't see her you know as a little girl you know so there's a lot of sexualization that has happened so would you just talk to us about that Oh, Carol, what's happening in our world is just, it's so concerning how everything is being sexualized. I just read the other day that now they're coming out with animation where it's all about sexualizing children and they're targeting children. And so, you know, children have all this access now, right, to computers and, you know, the internet and they can just be Googling like something for school and pornography will pop up. And they're trying to normalize that sex with children is normal and all these things that are so destructive. Yeah. Where pornography is normal and that couples should use it to spice up their marriage. Yeah. Uh, We're just living in a very pornified world where unfortunately the pornographers, and talk about, you know, in our country we're we're looking at some of the horrible issues and, and things that we need to look at. I, I'm, I'm glad we're having more discussions. I hope those will continue. Yeah. But one of the biggest problems in the world right now is the sexual slave industry, wow. which is how pornography. I mean, we have problems right here, right now. And how we are using men and women and children to make porn, to sexualize the world, And, you know, God wanted sex to be something that is so pleasurable and beautiful and protected and honorable and lovely for married couples to enjoy. Yeah. You know, we're all born sexual creatures. And so I believe that this is a time where we must be talking to our children more and more about sexuality. Not afraid that if we talk more to them. Yeah. We'll make them more interested yeah. in realizing it's not if our children are going to see these things, it's when. Yeah. And so we must be saying as parents, yeah. I need to be the sexual educator for my children. Okay, so it's interesting as you're saying that you need to be the sexual educator of children. Uh, um, I think one of the things that is happening, of course, now with just a very sexualized um, culture is that um, that there's something about body image, you know, where, fine, we're talking about pornography and we're we're seeing the sex trade, but then in our minds, we too have been sexualized. (laughs) We too, and and maybe you could talk a little bit about that in terms of just our body image and, you know, um, so just talk about, because we, you know, have, have also, been sexualized whether we are aware of it or not yeah oh we have been it's my goodness just on you know regular tv and our movies and the idea as a sex therapist i see the ideas they communicate like sex is instantaneous and um you know everybody should want to have intercourse and and i'm like oh my gosh that is not real this is you know, people want to rip each other's clothes off and just have spontaneous sex. And I'm like, this is not real. Yeah. And it just saddens me because, and we, and we say, this is how women should look. And this is how men should act. And, yeah. uh, you know, women, this is what sex is. Yeah. And men, you should always be wanting sex and be performing. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, it's so dehumanizing. <laughs> 
<laughs> everything about healthy human sexuality. So what does that what, what does that do then for for uh, for for you know for for the women you know this is what it means this is the way that you need to look or you know so what is it doing you know to our psyche? Oh, I think it's so damaging, and and I think it causes a lot of body image issues. Like, well, I don't look like that. Well, I'm not really in the mood for sex. So what's wrong with me? Yeah. And I don't. I don't feel good about my body and I'm like oh and we're telling men that you should look muscular and have all and it's so silly we are human beings, <laughs> human beings. ultimately I think God never wanted sex to be about performance or about having ideal bodies sex was meant to be a way that we human beings communicate love and commitment and this is a covenant between a man and a woman and we get to express that through this beautiful pleasurable experience of being sexual with one another yeah and so i think women feel like they can't measure up because pretty much most of the model for sexuality has been based more on male sexuality instead <laughs> of female sexuality and we're just now starting to discover that female sexuality is different okay. from male sexuality. Very okay. different. Okay, explain that. Just explain that. <laughs> Break it down for us. Yes. Well, you know, men, for one thing, men have a bigger sexual center in their brain. And so some men will think about sex. Now, I don't want to generalize anything because everybody's different. Everybody's different, right? Yeah. But if I were to generally speak, men have a bigger sexual center in their brain, so they think about sex more often than your typical female. Now, not always. Some women will have more testosterone, so they'll think about sex more than some yeah. other women do. Yeah. And they've had more pleasant experiences, so they think about sex in a more pleasant way. Um, but generally speaking, for females, what we've discovered after you've been married for a while or had a baby, then you slip more into sexual neutrality. Mm -hmm. Instead of like men can like have a sexual stimuli, like they see their wife get out of the shower and they're like, oh, let's have sex. Yeah. And she's more in sexual neutral. She's not thinking about sex. She's maybe thinking about, I've got to get the kids off to school and, and I've got laundry to do and I need to get to work. And we had a fight last night and I'm not even sure if I like you right now, you know? <laughs> so true. <laughs> and yes, so yeah. there's a yeah. lot of things that are going on with a woman and men are more single focused. So whatever a man is doing right now, he can be more single focused. Where women, we have our brains, or so we have diffused awareness. Now, the reason God made us that way is so we won't forget the baby in, you know, in the car, or we'll yeah. remember oh, I've got to feed the kids, or I've got this to do and this to do and this to do and this to do. Where men, their brains work more systematically. Like they, if they're, if they're in this, what I call, you know, like their waffle square, then they're over here. And we women are more like pancakes or spaghetti. We're just yeah. it all in. Yeah. So the females will be in sexual neutrality. This is why the Song of Solomon talks about the need for there to be foreplay. And that's where there's kind words. There's non-sexual touching. There's kissing. There's caressing. There's time for her mind to shift from neutrality about being sexual with her husband to slipping into first gear and going, oh, well, this might be nice. Yeah. But, she, but she's just in first gear. And so she needs time to go from first gear where, oh, maybe, to second gear to, oh, I, I, yes, okay. Oh, wait, I forgot to put the towels in the dryer. Oh, <laughs> you know. And the third gear where she's starting to warm up women need more warming up typically than men do now as men age they become more like us women oh where they be 
need more warming up as well. And so, and then, you know, a woman can get to fourth gear and maybe fifth gear and like, oh, well, that was fabulous. Why don't we do that more often? Yeah. You know, because she's had to get out of neutral and get yeah. to a feeling in the body. It takes women longer to get into our, get out of our busy brains and get into our bodies and allow ourselves to feel pleasure. Now, what happens to so many couples is they can think it's all about intercourse and it's, it's not for women. Yeah. Very, only 30% only of females orgasm through intercourse. It's more about an organ that God gave females and it's called the clitoris. Mm -hmm. And understanding that clitor the clitoris is much more like, similar to, different than, but similar to the male penis. And so when we start understanding that for females, it's, it's more about stimulating and enjoying her vulva than it is just about having intercourse. And that's why I think God is so sweet because when he made women, he gave us a part that has no other function except for sexual pleasure. Yeah. And so God is kind of saying, um, girls, I'm thinking about you. <laughs> yes. Yes, because women can get the idea and have been told that marital sex is more about duty. You're supposed yes. to do this. I think God is saying, no, no, no. If you make sex beautiful, then you're taking out all the fun, all the Yeah. Women, no, sex is for you. Yeah. And Body is that particular woman, you okay. know, because hormonally females we're we're changing all the time, right? Yeah, where men are steadier yeah. hormonally. Yeah, but we women, what's enjoyable sexually one day won't be the next day because we yeah. are mysterious and yeah. and we can't just easily figure it out, right? Yes, <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> yes. So um, I have so many women tell me that their mother said to them, when you get married, you need to have sex when your husband wants to. Oh, wow. and, or women who've been told by their pastors or, you know, you need to have sex when your husband wants to. Well, then it sounds like a duty. Yeah. And so it takes the fun out of sex, the pleasure out of sex, the spontaneity out of sex. Yeah. And it becomes a duty. Well, I just think that's horrible because if we read the Song of Solomon, yeah. she's the one. The Song of Solomon starts with her saying, kiss me. Yes, <laughs> it does. Fall on the mouth. Yeah. Because your, your kisses are sweeter than wine. So obviously, sex is not dutiful. Yeah. Sex is something that is pleasurable. It, you know, when we, when our husband kisses us, you start, he has more oxytocin and dopamine than we do. So it starts relaxing. It starts helping slowing down our brain. Yeah. And that's why the kissing, the caressing, the petting is so important for us women. Yeah. And why God designed our bodies for sexual pleasure. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, because of these dutiful messages we've got, which I don't think are biblical. Yeah. No. <laughs> Even Paul said, the apostle Paul, the single man said, yes. <laughs> but, you know, the marital bed is meant for mutual pleasure. Yes. Where the husband loves and cares about his wife's pleasure and sexuality yeah. and where the wife cares about his. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, and he says, you know, come together frequently, not because you have to, but because you get to. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Now, obviously, it takes a lot of grace. My husband and I have been married for 46 years. Yeah. And, you know, there's just ups and downs to our sexuality. Did you know that, Carol, right this minute, 50% percent 
of couples are having some sort of sexual struggle right this moment. Oh, wow. 50% you said? 60. 60%. 60. Okay. Yes. We have to normalize yeah. that sexual struggles are normal, but it creates, our sexual struggles can be so good for us. Wow. Because it can force us to have conversations, hard conversations, and talk about, well, this isn't really pleasurable for me, or I don't like this, or this is happening so fast that I'm not even warmed up yet, mm -hmm. and I need to slow down and wait for me, and I need us to sit and talk, yeah. and I need there to be some non-sexual touch. And I need us to be better. Can we be sexual friends? Can we make it safe for us to talk about things without, without us getting mad or hurt or yelling at each other or giving yeah. each other the silent treatment? Yeah. You know, some, so many couples, either there's violence or there's silence. Yeah. And I think both are equally harmful. And we have to learn how to other yeah. to be sexual friends you know i love in the song of solomon they call each other friends and lovers yeah and i'm like you know i i don't think you can be great lovers if you can't be friends to each other. yeah because if you can't be friends then you you're reactionary you're defensive and so you can't have the conversations you need to have where which could lead you to becoming great lovers to one another yeah. Now, um, Nancy, you know, you, you talked about uh, in 60% there, um, uh, there are struggles, uh, you know, sexually there are struggles. Um, now, would you just talk to us about pornography? Because I know that that is a big thing. And I know that many couples in an attempt, you know, to improve or to grow or whatever, you know, the, you, you had mentioned that they, you know, pornography is one of the things that they, they, they look to. So would you just share the impact of, of that on, in a marriage? What does yeah. pornography do in a marriage? Well, I think what happens, and honestly, many of my, many of the sex therapists in, in my country um, encourage couples to use porn. Uh, as a Christian, I don't, because I believe that, you know, the marital bed is meant to be protected. Now, I think there's meant to be lots of freedom, lots of fun. You can explore each other's bodies. There's lots of God-given permission to explore this. But I think that porn is harmful because what, gets happen what happens is those images get seared into our brains. And then we start thinking about those images. So then we aren't really being present with one another. Yeah. I believe that great sex happens when it's eye to eye, person to person, where you are present to, I want to share my body with you. Where if there's images that get seared, which they do, they get seared into the brain, then you aren't thinking about your spouse. You're thinking about those images, so you aren't really present with one another. And it's those images that are sexually arousing, not being present inside of your own body. My goodness, we have hundreds of erogenous zones. God has given us plenty of ways to be sexually aroused. <laughs> plenty yeah. of ways. You know, I think that pornography limits the God possibilities. Oh, wow. I think the shutting down of the possibilities of what God created our bodies to be able to do. Yeah. And okay. to discover. You know, my husband and I have been married 46 years. We're still discovering new ways to make love to each other. It's so much fun. But I think pornography closes that down. Yeah. Lose connection with the human element of human sexuality. And it becomes about these images, about these people we don't, we don't, we don't know. know. Yeah. And they may very likely, most likely, they're being sexually, they're sexual slaves in some way, shape or form. And it's very unethical. It's not a loving, kind industry, even though they want to 
look like it is. It's not. It's horrible. It's about human usury. And that's the last thing God wants. He doesn't want us to be slaves to anything. He doesn't want us to be slaves to pornography. He wants us to be free to love one another. Wow. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so uh, maybe, I mean, time has really flown. It's amazing. But maybe you could, you could tell us, um, uh, just given, you know, all these things, uh, you know, there's somebody out who's listening to us right now. And they're saying to themselves, oh, my goodness, you know, we are trapped. Uh, you know, we're having these kinds of um, problems uh, in our marriage. You know, we're not being able to communicate with one another. We're not friends, you know, to begin with. Uh, you know, we are really, really struggling. Yeah. And um, uh, maybe you could, and, and, you know, in our part of the country, we may not have therapists <laughs> in abandon like you would, <laughs> but maybe there's some maybe two or three things that you could tell somebody, look, if you're finding yourself in this situation, here are just a few pointers. Here are a few tips uh, that you could, you know, uh, you know, just that you could work on or start on working on right now that will help you. So yeah, maybe just a few tips that you could give us. Oh, that would be great, Carol. Number one, I think it's so important for us to have a healthy view of sexuality and that God is the creator of our sexuality, not the devil, not man, not woman, but God. And that he made us sexual creatures on purpose. It was not some sort of cosmic mistake. It is God's purpose and plan that we are sexual creatures. So, cause that will help de-shame the topic and normalize. Mm -hmm. And then number two, in, start connecting your spirituality your relationship with God and Jesus Christ, with your sexuality. Bring these two things together. How? Oh, how do you do that? <laughs> you know, right? Like so many couples are like, oh, like no, 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 no. God's not in our bedroom. He's when not. Have, no. But I'm like, well, why wouldn't he be? He's the creator of this beautiful, beautiful thing, and he wants to be our teacher, Ooh. and we need his help because we don't know what we don't know. And God is mystery, and so is human sexuality. It's, it's a mystery, right? Yeah, it is. And if we think we're gonna figure it out, we are wrong. And the ways of a man with a woman are one of the, one of the mysteries of the world, right? Sexuality is one of the mysteries of the world. Yeah. That's why we need to invite God into it. And I mean, there's been times where I've said, okay, God, Ron and I are just not connecting. We are not connecting emotionally, sexually, as friends. We are not connecting. Would you help us? Oh, wow. Would you help us. Would you teach us how to make love to each other? Would you teach us how to be sexual together? Would you yeah. help us through this rough time that we're going through? Even after 46 years of marriage? Yes, right? <laughs> right? Great. It's so... Yeah. That's so encouraging. Yes. It, there's always seasons to marriage and to your sexual relationship and to life. And whether it's having babies, breastfeeding babies, menopause, you know, health issues, getting older, energy, stress, work, COVID, yeah. you know, yeah. right? A lot. So yes. All these things affect stress, affects our sexuality more than anything else yeah so invite god connect your spirituality to your sexuality because they need to be intertwined like this okay and then the third one is make it safe to have conversations yeah you know lovingly say to your spouse we're in a hard time and but i love you at the end of the day, I might be really mad at you. I might be really disappointed. I might be sad. I might be hurting. But I want for us to be able to work and work this through. Yeah. So what do you need? And this is what I need. And could we learn how to have safe conversations? 
around our relationship and around our sexuality? And how can I be a friend to you sexually? Wow. And how can you be a friend to me sexually? Yeah. And how can we make our marriage bed a safe and loving and warm and nurturing place to be? Yeah. How can we like the sex we're having? Because honestly, I think everybody should like the sex they're having. Yeah. And if you don't like the sex you're having, there's a reason for it. Yeah. So we have to learn how to use our voice and talk about it. <laughs> Say, you know, I like the sex we were having like four years ago, but I haven't really liked it that well. Mm -hmm. And I'm not blaming it on you because everybody has to own their own sexuality. Yeah. If you don't like the sex you're having, it's, it's not your spouse's fault. We as individuals have to own it, take responsibility for it and say, I'm a sexual creature. What needs to happen in me? You know, we've, we've given yeah. men the idea that it's their job to give a woman, a, a, his wife, an orgasm. Yeah. He has no power to do that. Wow. Now, he can listen and learn and she can teach him what she likes. But a lot of women have been taught, you don't even talk about that. Yeah. You know, so women yeah. a lot of times haven't even figured out their own bodies. Yeah. You know, so women, we can have to figure out our own bodies, learn how to talk about it, you know. Show okay. and tell. <laughs> <laughs> how much show and tell? Oh, Nancy, this has been an incredible conversation. And um, in fact, what I'm asking is, what book do you have? I mean, I know I've, I've, I've kind of skimmed through this one, uh, Love and Sex. Um, and, and I'm wondering um, whether you've written another one that just helps couples have the kind of conversations that you're talking about. Um, have you written any? Well, you know, I hope in Love and Sex, I used a lot of stories. You did, yeah. Yeah, to make it safe to learn how to talk about sexuality. And I have a lot of examples in there. I have a couple in there who they've experienced porn, infidelity. She had childhood sexual abuse. He had his own trauma from childhood. And I kind of take the readers through this process of how a couple, the work they do, how they learn how to talk to each other, be more vulnerable together. So there's, I hope, I've had some couples say, we had to read the book three or four times to get all of that out of it. I'm like, yeah. yes, I, yeah. I hope there's so many making it safe for, if you've had trauma in your life, my goodness, we've got to find some safe people, yeah. safe, warm people. Because here's the thing, Carol, yeah. we can tell our scary, traumatic stories to somebody who will listen, yeah. be warm, then it takes it from the hippocampus and amygdala, kind of those strong feeling centers of our brains. Yeah. Move the traumas into a different part of our brain where it doesn't feel like it's happening right now. Yeah. Right? So yeah. the book talks a lot about how do we become safe to tell our stories to. Yeah. And then how do we heal some of those things? Yeah. So that we can be in the here and the now, which is yeah. what we need want to be able to do i'm yeah. working on another book where yeah i'm working on it carol but i haven't got it done yet it so. needs to come out it really does <laughs> would really look forward to that but this one is available on amazon i'm assuming yeah yeah thank you so much uh so uh if anybody wants to get this book it's actually called love and sex by nancy hewton uh, it will be flashing up on your screen and um, it's available on Amazon. And so you could go ahead and get yourself a copy. Uh, if you have been listening and, you know, what Nancy raised was, uh, you know, you've had some abuse in the past and, you know, this raises for you, uh, helps you understand, my goodness, I need help. Uh, there's a number at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you know, just give us your name uh, and indicate that you would like help and we will be able to direct you uh, to um, just local, to Kenyan uh, therapists who would be able to work with you on your journey. Uh, if you feel that you would like just, you know, support uh, to be part of a community of people who are discuss discussing marriage issues where you're being encouraged, you know, on your marriage journey, 
again, uh, just put down your name there, indicate to us that you're interested, and uh, we will put you in a community um, of people, uh, you know, who, are, who we are, you know, supporting one another and encouraging one another in our money, in our, in our marriage journey. So thank you again, uh, Nancy. Thank you so much. Maybe I could ask if you would pray, just pray for, you know, somebody who's listening uh, to us. Um, just pray, just pray. Uh, they, and they are, they are recognizing, my goodness, our marriage is not as it should be, as it ought to be. There's been pain. We've not been able to talk. You know, it's just a difficult place. Maybe you could pray as, as we come to an end. Oh, I'd love to. Thank you, Carol. Jesus, thank you that you love us. And you love those places that we feel, where we feel so much shame, embarrassment. Maybe we feel like there's hopelessness or it's too much for you or too much for other people to even know about. God, you love us in those places. You care deeply about every single person listening today, tonight. You want to be present with them and you want to come to those places and bring your healing and redemption and your love. And so, Father, I pray that your healing would begin right now that there would be hope, that your Holy Spirit would say, I am for you, I am with you. However you're struggling, I wanna be with you in the struggle. And nothing, including your sexuality, nothing, including your struggles, are too hard for me. Thank you for how you love us, God. Help us all to just open up our hearts to the depths and width of your love today. Love is the answer for all of our problems. It's in your name we pray, dear Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, and, and just speaking to us about a topic that is very close uh, to all of us and to everybody listening out there. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this Monday. Uh, until next week, good night and God bless you. See you next time. Thanks. Bye.